This lecture will deal with the period from 1929 to 1939, the period leading directly to the beginning of the Second World War. In October of 1929, the stock market in the United States crashed dramatically. This was the first event in the Great Depression for Americans, though there were signs and economic crises in other part of the parts of the world prior to this. As you can see from the chart above, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost almost one third of its total value in October of 1929. That did not stop the decline though. Stock market losses continued to plague the American market until the beginning of the Second World War. In the first year of the Great Depression, more than 600 banks failed in the United States. More than 25 million savings accounts were wiped out because of those bank failures. This was enough of a financial loss to affect nearly every American in some way. By 1935, 29% of Americans were unemployed. Initially, in 1929, the American government decided to take the classical economics line and do nothing, hoping that the economic slide would eventually hit bottom. The massive amount of job losses and economic problems faced by people at every level of society made this impossible, however. In 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president, and he began to take the approach of the most famous and unorthodox Western economist of the time, John Maynard Keynes. Keynes' prescription for such a downturn was that government should spend money in order to keep the economy moving and employment as high as possible. This, he said, would encourage spending and earn revenue for the government with which it could encourage more spending and investment, thus rebuilding confidence and financial security as the t at the same time. Roosevelt used this series of legislative moves to create what he called the New Deal. The US government put people to work. In Tennessee, the government built a series of dams and power stations that brought electricity to rural Tennessee for the first time. The Works Progress Administration put people to work building national highway system that could be used to transport goods to market and would eventually form the foundation of US travel infrastructure. These and many other methods made the United States government more active in the economy than it had ever been before. The economic hole was deep, however, and while a slow turnaround began about 1936, the United States did not reach its former levels of economic performance until the 1940s. During the process, dissatisfaction was high. There were strikes. 100,000 Americans emigrated to the Soviet Union to become part of the communist project. Extremists such as Father Joseph Coughlin and Senator Huey Long pre preached authoritarianism, and the most popular newspaper columnist in the United States was Adolf Hitler. Both the communist and Nazi parties grew tremendously popular in the United States. Many considered democracy to be on the way out, an ancient political system that did not solve modern problems. By 1931, Japan provided 35% of China's foreign investment. This meant that Japan was worried about Western moves to reduce presence in China and move toward a more normal trade situation. The Japanese position, particularly after Japan's Great Depression started in about 1926, was that Japan required more control rather than less. Control of the South Manchurian Railway, which Japan had taken from Russia during the 1904-05 war, was Japan's economic lifeline to the continent. When growing Chinese nationalism and the success of Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang party in unifying China seemed to threaten that link, several young officers in Japan's Kwantung Army, which was tasked with defending the railway, blew up a small portion of the tracks in order to make it look like Chinese nationalists had sabotaged the railway. This provided a pretext for the Kwantung Army to take control of the rest of Manchuria, an event that occurred so quickly that the Japanese government barely had time to react. In 1932, Japan attacked Shanghai as well. In 1933, the League of Nations condemned Japan's attacks, but not too strongly. In May of 1933, China signed a treaty accepting Japanese control over Manchukuo and the Shandong Peninsula. The League of Nations sent a commission to investigate the Manchurian incident under Lord Lytton. The conclusion of the Lytton Commission was that Japan was responsible for the attack and that the formation of the state of Manchukuo was not legitimate. The League had no way to enforce its decision and the Japanese delegation walked out of the League of Nations, abandoning collective security but maintained its control of the territories that had wrested from China. In May of 1933, China recognized Japan's control over Manchuria and North China in order to gain time. 
In December 1936, Guomindang and Chinese Communist Party agreed to set aside their differences and create a united front against Japan. In September of 1937, after an incident at the Marco Polo Bridge in Shanghai and in Shanghai, Japan invaded China and the Second World War in Asia was underway. And what you see here in pink is the extent of Japan's um, Japan's control in China. And even within this area, the Japanese usually controlled mostly just the urban areas and the countryside was uh, heavily fought over and includes these different uh, small port areas, including Shanghai and Guangzhou, uh, these territories down here. The red, of course, is Japanese colonies in uh, Korea and Taiwan. In 1935, uh, Italy attacked Ethiopia, and Italy's emperor, Haile Selassie, appealed to the League for help. The League imposed and then lifted weak sanctions on Italy, and Italy crushed Ethiopia using tanks and bombs and gas. Ethiopian King Haile Selassie made an impassioned speech before the League of Nations in 1935, but his pleas were not heeded. The League of Nations did not deny legitimacy to the Italian conquest and did not provide a loan to the Ethiopia to fund a resistance movement. It also lifted all sanctions against Italy for the invasion. On December 1, 1937, the Japanese army attacked the city of Nanjing, China's ancient capital city. On the night of December 12th, Chinese nationalist troops under the command of Chiang Kai-shek left the city secretly, hoping, hoping that the end of resistance and lack of an army inside would encourage the Japanese to treat city residents gently. Instead, the Japanese army stormed the city, rounded up and executed most men between the ages of 12 and 65, looted the city and brutalized, raped and killed other residents in one of the most horrific atrocities of the Second World War. Civilian deaths in Nanjing may have been as high as 300,000 people, according to official Chinese accounts. In 1935, Hitler and the Nazis broke important conditions of the Versailles Treaty and the Locarno Pact by sending German soldiers back into the Rhineland, which had been a demilitarized zone. For the Nazis, this was a gamble, as Germany was not yet strong enough to resist had the Allies decided to stop German rearmament at this point. The effect was to discredit the former victors of World War I as unwilling to stand up for their principles. This also was a part of the discrediting of democracy. During the 1930s, states around the world increasingly turned against democracy, forming authoritarian governments like those of Mussolini, Hitler, and Franco. In 1936, Spanish citizens elected a left-leaning secular socialist government. General Francisco Franco, a right-wing anti-socialist general in the Spanish army, gathered loyal members of the army and attacked the Spanish government. Despite the moderate nature of the Spanish government and the fact that it had been legitimately elected, the fact that it was dominated by a socialist party and had an ally in the Soviet Union led Great Britain, France, and the United States to refuse direct aid or open support for fear of being seen to support socialism. The only international ally the Spanish government had was the USSR, which was weak and far away. Franco quickly gained the support of Mussolini and Hitler, however, who sent supplies and even army and air force units to help him establish a fascist dictatorship. Franco and his right-wing forces eventually won the war, and his fascist dictatorship remained in control of Spain until he died in 1975. The world began to see the democratic West mired in the Great Depression, unable to help their allies or secure the peace they had created as weak-willed and unsuccessful. By contrast, the fascist and authoritarian states appeared to have solved their economic problems. Both Germany and Japan had emerged from depression by 1936, for example, and were solving their modern day problems quickly and it seemed completely. Liberalism and democracy were discredited. Countries began to approach Hitler for alliances and deals and Hitler saw this as an opportunity for quick gains. He also laid out more clearly in government memoranda his territorial aims. Here are Hitler's plans uh, as they are written in the Hosbeck Memorandum, which is minutes of a conference in the Reich Chancellery in Berlin in November, on November 5th of 1937. The meeting occurred from 4.15 to 8.30 p.m. 
and uh, Hitler was speaking. According to the memorandum, the Fuhrer then continued, quote, the aim of German policy was to make secure and to preserve the racial community, the Volksmasse, and to enlarge it. It was therefore a question of space. So Hitler's goals, even as early as 1937, were clearly to take as much territory as possible for the settlement of Germans. The cartoons below are uh, jokes about the way that uh, the democracies who were supposed to hold the Germans back, according to the treaties after World War I, instead essentially bent over or were crushed by the will of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. In the 1930s, Hitler pursued Anschluss, union with Austria. Austria had attempted to create such a union at the end of World War I when the Austrian Empire broke into pieces. However, the treaties and the League of Nations reduced, uh, refused to allow this union. By 1934, a majority of Austrians were in fact unlikely to vote to join a greater German Empire, so much so that Austrian Nazis felt that they could not find a way to change Austria with elections. Instead, they attempted a coup d'etat in that year, but failed to successfully overthrow Austria's elected government. Hitler used economics, his military, and politics to pressure Austrians to capitulate in 1938. When the Austrian government opened their borders to Germany, Hitler sent his forces into Austria. His representatives deposed the Chancellor of Austria and installed a new person in that role. The SS found and silenced political opponents of unification and encouraged citizens of Austria who did not favor union, such as Jews, Slavs, and Catholics, to stay home during a hastily arranged plebiscite. With threats against the lives of those who might not wish unification, Hitler achieved a 99.75% approval rating for union with Germany. Great Britain, aware that the election was neither free nor fair, still recognized the union using the election results as a reason. Austria and Germany had become one state, and Great Britain's acceptance made Britain again look weak. <clears throat> In 1938, Hitler focused on the German, have German inhabited region of Czechoslovakia. This was formerly a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire that had become independent and a republic at the end of World War I. Czechoslovakia had a multi-ethnic population, but large numbers of Germans happened to live in the area around its western edges, known as the Sudetenland. These Germans were Czech citizens and had no complaints about being part of Czechoslovakia. Hitler unilaterally decided that all Germans should be a part of the German nation, and he claimed that Czechoslovakia was discriminating against those Germans. There was no evidence of this. He decided that the Sudetenland should therefore be a part of Germany. Conveniently for Hitler, the majority of Czech armories, military bases, and fortifications were also in this part of the country. The Sudetenland is this area right here, this sort of all-covered region near Germany and Austria. In England, Neville Chamberlain uh, became UK Prime Minister in 1937. Chamberlain believed that closer relations with Germany would help to stop German disruption of Europe's peace. He sought to appeal to mutual interests rather than fear and wished to demonstrate good faith. In 1938, Chamberlain flew to Munich in Germany for a meeting with Hitler, Mussolini, and Daladier, the French Premier, Premier hoping to defuse the Sudetenland crisis and prevent war. After 13 hours of negotiations, they reached an agreement for the surrender of the Sudetenland to Germany. No Czech or German representatives were present at these negotiations, so Chamberlain essentially gave away territory that did not belong to Great Britain. But with no allies to help defend it, Czechoslovakia was powerless to stop the process. In fact, the Munich con conference gave Hitler all of his demands, and it gave Poland and Hungary slices of Czechoslovakia as well. This is the most egregious example of Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. The idea that if he allowed Hitler to take the territories he claimed were German, according to his nationalist thinking, eventually Germany would be satisfied or appeased and no longer be aggressive in taking territory. Chamberlain returned home from Munich, the Munich conference proclaiming that they had achieved what he called peace in our time. Germany quickly moved into the Sudetenland. Then, after securing its bases and military material, used it as a staging ground to take control of the rest of Czechoslovakia in what was a complete disregard for the treaty just signed. That result led to the embarrassment of Chamberlain, who could do nothing about it. The British had no choice but to accept this result and hope that Germany would stop its aggression with Czechoslovakia. 
Chamberlain became deeply unpopular because he now appeared to want to avoid war at any cost. This may also have encouraged Hitler to do more rather than less as he learned that he could bully France and Great Britain and get away with it. Ultimately, Britain's response to the Czech result was to end its appeasement policy toward Germany, make public statements guaranteeing the sovereignty of Poland, which appeared to be the next German target, and to prepare for probable war by instituting the first peacetime draft in British history to build up its armed forces. France also began active war preparations. The United States remained isolationist, but President Roosevelt gave his famous quarantine speech in Chicago, calling for a quarantine against the quote, epidemic of world lawlessness and claiming that the United States should end its isolationism. The American mood, however, remained isolationist and Roosevelt's idea, despite the fact that it made no mention of any specific states, was protested and heavily criticized by non-interventionist politicians. The mood in the United States in the 1930s was very much isolationist. American politics came down clearly on the side of staying out of the war and trading with all participants, no matter what side they were on. The idea that the business of America is business took on a very isolationist tone in this period. While over the course of the 1930s, the mood gradually shifted away from isolationism, the final choice of the United States to join the war in Europe could not be made until Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. On December 8, 1941, in a speech before Congress, Roosevelt asked for a declaration of war with Japan. When, five days after the Pearl Harbor attack, Hitler decided to support his ally Japan by declaring war on the United States, Congress quickly agreed to extend its declaration to include war against Germany. Isolation ended in 1941. In 1939, it became clear that Poland and the Danzig Corridor were Hitler's next target. The Danzig Corridor was a small spur of Poland that crossed the former territory of East Prussia and included the German city of Danzig. Polish named Gdansk. This allowed Poland a port in the Baltic Sea so that it could have access to global trade. The fact that it had been carved out of East Prussia at the end of World War I made it a thorn in the side of Germans. Taking it back had become a major priority to Hitler. German armies crossed the border into Poland on September 1, 1939, in the first use of the Blitzkrieg tactic. Blitzkrieg meant lightning war. This was a method for keeping the attack moving quickly. German aircraft went ahead of the army to destroy military installations and gun emplacements and to clear the roads for the German army. Next came the divisions of panzer tanks, moving as quickly as possible and destroying major targets and spots of resistance along the way. Behind the tanks, using their armor for safety, came the German infantry, whose job was to do the ground fighting, take territory, and occupy cities and towns. Finally came the SS, which functioned as a kind of psyops and political invader. SS units defied, identified Jewish villages and populations and isolated and, where possible, annihilated their populations. They identified local political leaders and teachers and executed them as publicly as possible to shock the Poles into recognizing they had been defeated and to break down leadership and ideological nationalist systems. They burned churches and destroyed religious leadership as well. By the end of September, though German attacks in the West and Soviet attacks in the East, Poland was conquered, then divided according to the terms of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the secret agreement between Stalin and Hitler to eliminate Poland and share its territory. The British and the French declared war three days after the invasion of Poland and gave symbolic support to the Poles, but were unable to do anything materially because of the geography and their lack of access to the Baltic Sea. Germany eventually conquered Warsaw and herded all Jews into the city, into, which, into a small space of several blocks known as the Warsaw Ghetto, which they then sealed off, essentially isolating Warsaw's Jewish population. Germans occasionally used some of the Jews for work parties, but for the most part, they sealed the people in the ghetto and allowed them to starve. This was one of the first acts of what would become the Holocaust. In World War II in Europe was now underway. It would become the most destructive war in human history, in which the main target was civilian populations. This was the new twist on total war, assisted by new and murderous technology.